uh, uh, please mute all uh, if you can. Mute all mics. Uh, our talk today is about one of the uh, very common anomalies in pediatric surgery. Uh, and uh, there is a lot of controversy actually about many issues in uh, understand the testes, whether palpable or impalpable. So let's go and see uh, about the content of what I'm going to talk about today. We'll talk about the incidence and the etiology, uh, the effect of genes and syndromes in understand the testes. What about the retractile testes management, surgery, hormonal treatment, or, no, or none? When we need to do laboratory investigations, and what is the role of imaging? The very highly controversial hormonal treatment, what is the place of hormonal treatment in understand the testes? And then we come to the role of surgery in uh, management, whether for the palpable or impalpable. And fi finally, we'll have to look on the complications. Of course, when we talk about uh, this uh, highly controversial issue, we need to resort to guidelines. There are very nice guidelines either from the European Association of uh, Pediatric Urology or for American Association of Pediatric Surgery. And I'll send it to you uh, immediately after this uh, meeting. It's very useful and it gives you exactly the level of evidence of all the recommendations. There is strong evidence, there is weak evidence, and there is still controversial issues. So let's, let's talk about the incidence. It's very important to look at this slide to see that it's, it's very high in the preterm, in the premature. It is up to 30%. When we come to the term boys, it, it reached 4% of term boys. It goes to 1% at three months, and it remains at that level until the rest of life. So at 12 months, it is still 1%. This slide shows very nicely that the descent is not expected after three months of age. The instance is the same at three months at, at, and at 12 months. Well, the etiology is very highly multifactorial. There are many factors involved in the testicular descent. There are a lot of anatomical, uh, hormonal, genetic mechanisms underlying. So we'd like to say that the exact etiology is unknown or at least multifactorial. Well, the, the, the very outstanding uh, role is, uh, which is a principal determining factor, is the weight at birth. It is very dependent on the weight at birth, which is very highly likely in the small for gestational age. Well, let's look at some of the genetic syndromes as associated with cryptorchidism. Actually, they are, uh, we can name up to uh, 390. Uh, syndromes associated with uh, uh, cryptorchidism. If you have enough time, we can name them all. But if not, we'll try to summarize what are the most important. In prune belly syndrome, in 100% of the patients, you'll find uh, understand the test is bilateral. Noonan syndrome, 50%. Klein filter, 27%. Down syndrome, 6%. And there are other syndromes like because Whitman syndrome and D-Lang syndrome and prader willi syndrome. A lot of syndromes have understand the testes as part of the presentation. We can summarize or categorize this into two types. One of them is due to reduced androgen production because the mechanism of testicular descent is highly dependent on hormones. So any syndrome which will affect androgen production will lead to bilateral undescended testes, like androgen insensitivity, Leydig cell agenesis, gonadotropin deficiency, anti mullerian hormone biosynthetic receptor defect. This is one group of reduced androgen production. The other group of reduced intra-abdominal pressure, which is obviously in cases of prune belly, gastroschisis, and omphalocy. Let's look at the environmental risk factors. It is well known that the exposure to anti-androgenic or endocrine disruptors will contribute to the development of cryptorchidism, especially in the first trimester, like pesticides, uh, phthalate, uh, uh, phthalates, uh, brominated 
flame retardant, diacyl steel bisterol, all of this can lead to uh, production of uh, cryptorchidism, if, especially if the pregnant mother is uh, exposed during the first trimester of pregnancy. Now let's look at the uh, retractile testes, what you need to do. Well, the retractile testis is, is very well known to be absent at birth because the effect of uh, maternal hormones at that time or placental hormones. It is maximum at the middle of childhood, that's five, six years, and usually it disappears at 10 years. Well, are they all the same? Are they all benign? Or some is masquerading in some uh, different uh, presentation? Well, what we need to do uh, uh, for the retractile test is, is first you make sure that they are truly retractile because some of the alleged retractile testes proves later on to be a low-lying undescended testes or even a perineal ectopic testes very near to the scrotum can be mistaken in the young age for a retractile testes. So careful examination is needed. Sometimes it is not easy, by the way. And you don't give a, a clue to the patient that he's normal and needs nothing to be done, but you need yearly follow up till puberty because some will ascend. There is a definite instance of testicular ascent. Then so what is the difference between uh, the uh, uh, retractile testis? Uh, we are talking here about the ascending testis and uh, understand the testes. The difference is that the ascending testes, there is no effect on fertility and there is no predisposition to malignancy. It responds better to hormonal treatment. And whenever you plan to do surgery, you can do it using a scrotal approach. So these are the differences between ascending testes and undescended testes. So the general recommendation for the uh, retractile testes, no treatment, follow up uh, yearly until puberty. Uh, now, uh, careful examination sometimes in uh, unilateral impalpable uh, testes will reveal that there is obvious contralateral hypertrophy. So my question now, do you consider Contralateral hypertrophy, a sure indication of the absence of testes on the other side. Uh, Dr. Temer, can you please send uh, the poll regarding this issue? Okay. Uh, now, uh, now we have a poll. We have a, a poll item on the uh, lower bar uh, below the screen. So everybody can enter the poll and enter the answer. ممكن تبعته تاني دكتور تامر كلنا شايفينه كده؟ لا طيب نبعته تاني؟ اه يس اي كان سي ات ناو اوكي ذا كويشن ناو از دو يو كونسيدر كونترا لاترال تستيكر هايبرتروفي ا شور انديكيشن اوف تستيكر ابسنت؟ بليز فوت اند ان ا مينيت ويل سي يور يور ريسبونس So until we receive your <clears throat> response, there is a, a very interesting study coming from Japan on Japanese children, where they found that there is an optimal cutoff value of contralateral testicular size, which predicts uh, actually the absent testes on the other side. All the children where uh, testicular size was above a certain limit had absent uh, testes on the other side. And this, now? Just to remind you, people do the poll on the poll option, not in the chat, so we can get a higher number. You don't do the poll and answer in the chat. Ah. There is something called option called polls, answer in the option. Thank you, Mr. Asif. No, thank you. 
uh, علشان تطلع uh, in order to see the results we'd like to use the poll function which you click on your choice and uh, click on submit then we can know exactly what is your opinion so again back to the Japanese study they found uh, a definite number above which you can say that the other testis is not present this number is volume of 21 millimeter or a maximum dimension of 1.6 uh, centimeter. All the children were, were uh, findings above this value were find absent, but would you take it into practice or not? Can you submit uh, Dr. Tamer, uh, the result? With, now we have like 86% um, of the results, that's uh, 148 votes. Okay, very good. Well. You can share, yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, the majority, 78%, uh, says no. Well, actually, uh, maybe you are right because uh, you can never be sure until you see by yourself, you look by laparoscopy. But maybe if you have larger numbers in, in multicentric studies, one day, not, not today, we can come to the conclusion that this can spare laparoscopy if you find the testes above certain limit. Not now I agree, and the majority of you agree on this, but I tell you my, my own personal experience in each time I, I judge by clinical examination that this testis is abnormally big, uh, I didn't find the testis on the other side, but I still, I agree with you, still I do uh, laparoscopy. Yeah. <laughs> لما يبقى في هايبرتروفي في الكونترا ترانسيستس حجمها اكثر من 1.8 سي سي لقينا التست اللي جوه ابسنت او اتروفيك او مش موجود فانا باكد على كلام حضرتك ان الكونترا لاترال هايبرتروفي سنتس ويز سيرتن ليميتس از ان ا جود انديكيشن فور Predictive value, a good predictive value for the contralateral tests. Thank you very much, Professor Rafi. We'll go on. I agree with uh, Laboratory uh, blood tests are actually uh, not indicated uh, routinely for the uh, <clears throat> unilateral uh, undescended tests. But in special situation, we need to do some labs, blood tests. That's in bilateral and in cases associated with hypospadias, cases you suspect the presence of DSD. And then this is what you are going to do. You'll do karyotyping. Some of these cases will be masculinized uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. You need to do uh, FSH and LH. Uh, probably sometimes you'll do malaria inhibiting substance and inhibin, and you do uh, HCG stimulation test to make sure of the absence of testicular tissue. So in special situation, you do the labs, and these are the labs, uh, karyotyping and hormonal studies. So now we come to the role of imaging, and I may, may take your permission that we'll keep the, uh, all the mics mute, and we'll keep the discussion till the end of uh, the presentation. Now, what is the role of imaging? Well, we have the ultrasound, ultrasonography, CT scanning, MRI, and most of them are inaccurate. In the whole, overall, the, the uh, accuracy rate is 44%. And this uh, by Jack Elder, clearly uh, a statement, ultrasonography is unnecessary in evaluating boys with non-palpable testes. So there is no, no need to do uh, imaging. Uh, here we can see, in the higher resolution transducers machines, more than 7.5 megahertz, you can get the better results, but still uh, it can see, of course, 100% of palpable testers, but only 84% of non-palpable undescended testers. And this is with the best machines. Of course, with the classic machines, you can get much less results. 
sensitivity of 76%, specificity of 100%. So the final word is unnecessary, not recommended. But when to do, uh, we have exceptions. We can say that we have some special cases that need ultrasonography. Sometimes inguinal testes in the obese uh, patient, you cannot uh, easily uh, feel the testes. So it's very helpful, as we said, in the palpable or in the inguinal, it is 100% accurate. And the in bilateral, not to detect the testes, but to see the uh, internal genitalia. Maybe you can find uh, inter pelvic uterus or uh, internal genital. So these are the selected case of ultrasonography. In the regular case, they are not indicated. MRI have got sensitivity of 90% and specificity of 79%. So again, it's not recommended. It needs a sedation or anesthesia, and uh, uh, it is not, uh, of course, it is expensive. There's one word here that we'd like to say that MRA or MRV, M magnetic resonance uh, angiography or magnetic resonance venography is 100% sure but it is not available in every center. It is very expensive and it needs anesthesia and there is no benefit over laparoscopy. So from the theoretical point of view, it is 100% accurate, but again, not recommended for routine use in impalpable tests. Now we come to the highly controversial issue of hormonal treatment for descent, to induce descent. A meta-analysis of HCG treatment of cryptorchidism concluded that the treatment is uh, not very effective uh, more than the placebo. The American Neurological Association guidelines recommended against the use of hormonal therapy to induce testicular descent due to the low response rate and lack of evidence of long-term efficacy. And if we look here to this graph, it's very obviously this is a placebo in the range of 10%. This is HCG and gonadotropin releasing hormone. Both of them are in the range of 20%. And if you wait a little bit, you will get reascent once again. So you get results in the range of 15%. This is compared to 95% result success of surgery. So again, for this scent, hormonal treatment is not recommended. Now let's look at another face of the coin hormonal treatment for fertility. There is a lot of uh, publications coming to say that the hormonal treatment may improve fertility. These are the European guidelines. They suggest offering endocrine for special cases. That is the bilateral undescended testes with biopsy confirmation of low fertility index. There are reports that show that this can improve the fertility index and one of uh, uh, colleagues in uh, Bosnia, Farouk Slimovic, has done more than 80 publications about the hormonal treatment in uh, uh, understand the testes, and he has got results suggesting that it improves the fertility. These uh, results and these studies did not reach a, a high level of evidence, so it is uh, to be taken cautiously. Now, what is the timing for surgery for the palpable undescended testes? The guidelines will say that between six months and 12 months is the proper time to do the surgery. And the uh, European uh, guidelines say maximum by 18 months. So I think that six months is right answer and 12 months is right answer. And a few days ago, I sent a poll to, to see what is your preference, the majority uh, maybe 80% uh, said they prefer to operate at six months. Well, I have a point here that uh, again, six months and 12 months is the correct answer, but early surgery, there is a potential of injury to the delicate structures, vas and vessels. However, uh, experienced surgeons are doing the operation, but still when you operate at six months, you see the vessels and the vas are extremely fragile. So maybe if you wait until 12 months, this will minimize the possibility of injury to the vas and vessel, and still you are in the correct window, the safe window of 6-12 months. Uh, this is a question here. Uh, in understand the testes, you, 
90% of the cases, you will find the patent processes vaginalis or hernial sac. So would you uh, like it or just divide? We have another pool here. We can send it. In other sense, you always insist on ligating the hernia sac. Yes, always. No, not necessary. Of course, if it, there is a clinical hernia, you need to uh, ligate the, the hernia sac. But if there is no clinical hernia and you have the patent processes, do you insist on ligating or not? This is, we, uh, we are waiting for your response. The, the pool is on. We are almost 75% of the participants uh, have voted. Very good. And still counting. So I can declare the answer now. Okay. Yeah. So th this is for like a mo almost 80%. All right. Uh, Almost 60% uh, always, 30% uh, not necessary. And I'm sure those who did not do it necessarily did not have to regret it. Because in this uh, article, as you can see here, orchopexy without ligation of the processus vaginalis is not associated with increased risk of inguinal health. Sometimes the peritoneum, the processus vaginalis is extremely and if you try to grasp the whole boundaries, you might cause injury to the vase or vessels. So it is not necessary unless you have a clinical hernia. Uh, of course, uh, all of you know about the Bianchi approach for uh, scrotal approach for undescended testes, uh, low lying uh, testes or uh, ascending testes. You can approach with a single incision not a double incision. And uh, of course, the, you need to select your patient if he is uh, not obese, if he is, uh, uh, the test is accessible from scrotal incision. But this is very cosmetic and actually results in uh, similar success rates to the classical approach. This is Bianchi and many of, I think many of you are uh, using the same technique. Now we come to the uh, high palpable uh, peeping testis. We can say sometimes you have a high uh, testis at uh, the inguinal canal or peeping testis. Sometimes it is tempting to operate these cases uh, through an inguinal incision on one stage. If you look at this success related to versus location in a meta-analysis by Dosimo, you see that success rate beyond the yeah. external ring is 92%. If you go intracanalicular, it's 87%. If you go to the peeping testes, it is 82% and the abdominal 74 So looking at the peeping testes, there is atrophy rate of about 20%. So probably there is a, a role to do something else for this specific category, the high palpable, and the peeping testes. And let's look at this publication from Mexico by Mario Riquelme. He is using laparoscopy for the palpable, high palpable undescended testes during 15 years of experience. This is different, of course, from the classical most people are doing, but you need to look carefully for the high palpable testes at the uh, uh, peeping, at the deep ring or high canalicular the classical approach yields uh, some significant atrophy rate. So in this uh, study, the uh, common low type, the atrophy rate was 5%. In the high type, high purple was 9%. So this is significant difference. Probably you need to do something else. Uh, you need laparoscopic assisted mobilization of the vessels or uh, something else. Now we go for the surgical options for impalpable testes. And here you see the findings at laparoscopy in general. You need to tell the, the parents that you have a chance of finding an intra-abdominal testis in 50% of the case. You need to warn the, the parents about this. The others is blind ending vessels and uh, vas and vessels passing through. So these are the three possibilities for uh, when you look immediately by laparoscope. And the surgical options, of course, as you know, 
is one stage follower stiffen, two stage follower stiffen, lap assisted orchopexy, or the shihata technique. Please vote for your preference of surgical technique. I will not try to influence your choice, of course. Dr. Shahata, you cannot vote because you're biased here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm happy that many of the colleagues in different centers uh, around the world are uh, happy with uh, their results about the laparoscopic traction without dividing the testicular vessels. I think the results are worldwide satisfactory now, yes. Yeah, I, uh, I think if you, you have to choose between cutting the main blood supply of the testis and main, keeping it, I think that the uh, choice will be uh, obvious. So we are almost like 72%. I think we're going to uh, share the results. Okay. Okay, very good. It's surprising. Now, uh, yeah. Uh, two stage power Stephen 41 percent, uh, Shihata uh, 32, and the others lab assisted and one stage. That's very good. Uh, this is one of the points we still we don't have consensus or uh, firm guidelines. It takes some time by uh, controlled studies, and I'm sure we'll reach to that in the uh, near future. Now, one of the findings is. Um, when you find the vas and vessels passing through the deep ring, uh, and I think here you have a, a, another pull. Would you do inguinal, inguinal uh, exploration or no? You have a vas and vessel, it's impalpable. Uh, you do it always, you do never, or only when you have Patent processes vaginas. Of course, this is one of the points. Uh, there is a classical teaching. There are publications against the classical teaching. There is no firm evidence about uh, the conclusion. There is different practice. So we'd like to know your practice now by uh, looking at the pool results. And until this will come, uh, let's look at the, this important slide. I think this is coming. Uh, is excision of the testicular nubbin necessary in vanishing testis syndrome? There is another uh, publication coming from Turkey also about this. They studied a large number of testicular nubbins and uh, yes, uh, majority, as I said, this is classical teaching, uh, always will do exploration, but there is a good number will not do it or will do it only when there is patent processes vaginal. This is good. And I think all the answers are correct because we don't have a consensus. So you, you need to individualize treatment according to your belief. But you need to know this uh, important fact that by studying a large number of testicular nubbins, uh, the incidence of uh, viable germ cells was very low. So the potential for future malignancy is very low. Maybe if you have a patent process of vaginalis, there is a possibility of finding a good sized testis. But if it is closed, there is nubbin. Maybe there is no much benefit of removing the nubbin. Again, there is no firm evidence for that, but I'm putting the current literature uh, uh, before you. Uh, another good question is when you find a contralateral, uh, when you find a single testis, would you do a prophylactic pexy on the other side or not? You have a single testis, uh, the other one is vanishing or absent, so you do pexy or not? For the normal uh, descended testis.
Well, it's, it's surprising that uh, the practice is a bit different among everybody. So there is no like right or wrong. Uh, this is what I'm saying. Actually, there are a lot of issues about understanding the thesis. There is evidence, but it is not strong evidence, not level, not level one or two. So 30% uh, will do PEXI, 70% will not do PEXI. I'll tell you my argument for doing, I do PEXI. And this is uh, an interesting paper, uh, to be or not to be, to PEX or not to PEX what to do for the contralateral thesis when anaben is discovered. Well, I have seen by myself and some of my friends have seen cases of torsion in a single testis when the patient did not do PEXI. They may be a small number, but, but in this catastrophic event, a single case is enough. So if you know that I had a case and uh, Sharif Shahata, my friend has got another case, would you change your practice or not? Sometimes one case is enough to warn you that it is possible, and if it happens, it will be catastrophic. And putting in mind that the PEXI is a very simple procedure, it takes 10 minutes to put uh, stitches to the septum dartus through a median scrotal incision, and you, I, I feel I can sleep at night. I feel comfortable that uh, the worry about the rare incidence of uh, torsion is not there. Now we come to the uh, post-pubertal presentation. You have a boy coming to use unilateral uh, undescended testes at the age of 14 years, 15 years. So what you are going to do, these are the recommendations. Uh, younger than 32 years with unilateral, you do archaeotomy. And men older than 32 years, you can have close observation and physical examination. This is, comes from the rel relative uh, danger of having malignancy and the relative complications of uh, anesthesia. So below 32 years, orchiectomy, after 32 years, observation. Uh, now, some of the rare uh, associations, as we said, we have uh, some associations with uh, Undescended and interabdominal test, sometimes you find the persistent Mullerian remnant. And the question here would you uh, insist on removing uh, the Mullerian structures uh, during the operation or not? Uh, Dr. Temer, I'm not sure if there is a poll related to this, this or not. Actually, we are not, we have not prepared the poll about this topic. Okay. So, would you remove the uh, uh, Mullerian structure in the uterus or not? Well, in this uh, publication study, management of patients with persistent malaria syndrome uh, and understand the thesis, the conclusion was that the goal of uh, approach in persistent malaria system is to preserve the testes uh, and put them in the normal location and leaving the malaria remnant is a suitable option for two reasons. Number one, the instance of malignancy is almost unknown in this retained Mullerian structure. And again, removing the Mullerian structures will jeopardize the testicular vascularity. It's very difficult because the vast difference is very close to the Mullerian structure. So uh, if you try to remove it, you jeopardize the vascularity of the test. So maybe you slit it in the middle to be able to bring uh, a bilateral testis down. Now let's look at the complications, and I think we're going uh, nicely with the uh, time frame. Uh, if you look here that the fertility in unilateral undescent, this is the normal sperm count in 83% of the cases, the paternity is almost 90%. So this is very similar to the general population. So we can say confidently that the fertility in unilateral undescent testis is similar to the general population. Well, if you come to the bilateral, the story is different. You have a 44% normal spurt count and the paternity between 33 and 65%. So markedly affected paternity. We go to the malignancy, you look at the real numbers from uh, meta-analysis and large series, you will find that the instance is low in the general population of testicular carcinoma is really low. It is four per 100,000. While in undescended testes, the risk ratio 
is multiplied by up to eight, it comes to 12 to 33 per 100,000. Be careful that the contralateral normally descended uh, side is a slightly increased incidence of cancer. What orchiopexy does for this uh, risk ratio, it reduces but does not eliminate the risk. It reduces from 5.4 to 2.2. So uh, orchiopexy before puberty, this is how it measured for malignancy, it reduces from 5.4 to 2.2. So let's look at the summary of the guidelines uh, at the end. We have the age of orcopexy recommended between six and 12 months. In retractile testes, no surgery or hormonal treatment is recommended, but yearly follow up watchful for the appearance of ascending testes. No imaging is required for the classical case of undescended testes, especially in selected cases. And hormonal treatment, again, is not recommended to induce testicular descent. But hormonal treatment may improve fertility in some bilateral cases with delayed germ cell maturation. And laparoscopy is the gold standard for diagnosis and treatment of impalpable tests. Well, uh, this is for the uh, outline of the uh, guidelines. I will have a, a quick video uh, for the uh, laparoscopic traction so that you may like to see the steps and the uh, technical uh, tips and tricks in doing the laparoscopic traction. So I'll stop share here. And maybe I'll allow uh, Dr. Tamer, if you look at the chat area, and see until I prepare the video and see if there is any questions written in the chat area. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sena. And actually, it's a, it was a very nice presentation backed with evidence. And that is a, a point that we all need, is not saying just personal opinions and differentiate between practice and evidence. Uh, we have a lot of questions. So do you mind if you start uh, asking them while you're preparing your video? Uh, I'm ready, of course. Um, there is a question about um, the instance of the, the uh, completion of descent. So uh, you have said that uh, the instance uh, ends by the age of three months, yes. right? Yes. So um, somebody is asking about is there an acquired undescended testis? Um. The, uh, it is, has been uh, seen that there is no descent that will happen after three months of age, maximum by six months. So the definition of undescended testis is testis that does not reach the scrotum at the age of three months. Sometimes this is added to the definition. So uh, vicryl 4O between the septum dartus and the uh, tonica albigini of the test. This is a point, and the, the, the complication rate of this technique, if you do it carefully, is nil. I, I have never seen any complication of that. The issue of uh, some parenchymal injury due to the suturing is okay. If this will happen, that you will injure 100% 1 of the parenchymal cells of the testis compared to the possible loss of 100% of the testicular parenchyma. So maybe I am inducing 1% injury, but to save 100% loss. Dr. Rafi, please. Dr. Rafi, Shalabi? Yes. Please. Dr. Rafi, please. Thank you, Dr. Samah. Samani? Yes, I am very happy. What do you think about uh, the uh, laparoscopic rule for high uh, palpable undescended tests. Is there a rule for laparoscopy or you prefer to do open? Thank you very much, uh, Professor Rafi, for this question. Uh, I'll tell you the truth. Uh, it's very tempting when I'm doing laparoscopy, I find the uh, testes passing through open uh, uh, deep ring. I do inguinal exploration and I do uh, one stage inguinal orchopexy. And I'll have to admit it, I regret it in uh, some few occasions. There is ascent, testicular ascent, or testicular atrophy. So be careful.
with peeping testes or high palpable testes, don't take it lightly. And I agree with Professor Rafik that either I will do laparoscopic mobilization of the vessels uh, to gain more lens and to have a very comfortable placement in the scrotum, or I'm not shy to say it, I would bring it inside and I, I do a two stage in a bilateral case. In a bilateral case, the, the loss possibility of bilateral loss is there. So if I have a bilateral peeping testis, I will do the uh, staged procedure traction and the bring the peeping testis inside better than to pull it uh, too much down. Fiso Altur Samah. Uh, is the size and the quality of vessels exiting the internal ring on laparoscopy? Does the size and the quality of vessels have a significant impact on the surgical option of inguinal exploration? Of course, this is a very good question. Uh, if, you if you have a good quality vessels, then there's good reason to explore the inguinal canal, even if the ring is closed. If it is a small, hypoplastic vessels, there is good reason not to explore. So this is a very good question and very good remark. I'll try to share the video here. Is there time to have more questions? Now, if you can see, this is a short video. Here, a left-sided uh, intra-abdominal testis exactly at the deep ring. And here you can see that we are careful about the vase because the vase difference is very near or looping down the deep ring in these cases. So we're pulling up and then dividing the gubernaculum under vision. Bit by bit, this is a cutting current, not coagulation current, because coagulation will lead to transmission. And uh, one millimeter by one millimeter, you can see that we are dividing the gubernaculum carefully. And then you apply the basic principle of hook, pull it up, C and then buzz, hook, look, and cook. Then at this stage, you are going to measure the testis again is the deep ring on the other side. If it goes to the deep ring on the other side comfortably, then it can come down without traction, but this is rare. The stitch is coming from the other side, one inch above and medial to the deep ring, to the anterior spelex spine. This is Ethibon 2O on round needle. And this is a single bite in the tonica albuginea. As you can see here carefully because the testis is fragile. You, you uh, respect the curvature of the needle. You don't pull too much on the thread. You need uh, adequate length of the thread inside. And then you take it out using many different techniques. This is a port closing instrument and you can pull the thread outside to be held in the hand of the assistant. Don't pull too much. This will assist you in the next step of the uh, dissection. So there is a distance of about two to three centimeters from the abdominal wall. And you look here, you will see that the peritoneum lateral to the testicular vessels, I'm dissecting again with hook, hook uh, monopolar diathermy, but using cutting current and short bus. And here you can see clearly the vase, and you are dissecting near the vase clearly to make straight pass from the vase and vessel towards the other point of fixation. Now you can see here we are remaining one centimeter. You are tying down the stitch by, you see the laxity of the uh, vessels at this stage. This is very important. After 12 weeks of waiting period, look at the difference in the laxity of the vessels now. 
there is a remarkable difference. Now you can see the vessels going all the way to the top of the abdominal uh, wall, at least six to eight centimeters gaining length. You cut the fixing point very easily in one second, and then you are going to bring the testis down either from a scrotal incision in a small sized infant or from an inguinal incision in a bigger size or obese child. And make sure to make a wide opening for the exit of the testis. You don't need to force it while going down. Here passing through. And you look from outside, you see a testis coming very comfortably without tension and in good vascularity. And if you look from inside, you see the uh, intact uh, vessel. So this is uh, a summary of the technique. I'll be happy to answer any question. Well, excellent technique as usual. So we have uh, some questions. Dr. Mohammed Awheba, tfadda. Dr. Mohammed. دكتور سامح اهلا دكتور محمد ايوه انا زان انا انبسطت جدا ام ام فيري هابي وذ ذا بول ذات يو ميد اباوت ذا ستارت اوف مانجينج ذا ايج اوف سيرجيكال مانجمنت اوف ذا اندسندد تيستس ويذر بوزبل اور انبوزبل وي هاد اوبشنز فروم 3 تو 12 مانث رايت يس ماي كويستشن از واي وود يو start management at three months because i have a story i have a case i have a case that i regretted not starting management at three months and i'll tell you the story but I, my question is when would you think you may need to do a pexy with a possible start management at three months well uh, first we get it we go to the uh, guidelines and the guidelines are talking about six to 12. My personal uh, belief that at six months, me, uh, I'm sure you are, you are, uh, can do it safely at this age, but sometimes I find the vessels are very uh, small and fragile and so the vast. And I'm afraid that this might induce some injury. So personally, I wait for 12 months. Maybe uh, you have uh, some case report about a complication that happened earlier than that, but I haven't seen it. And I go with the maximum allowance of the recommendations. I operate at 12 months. What was your case? What was the problem at three months? Look. Uh, no. Um, medicine pediatric. He consulted me on the phone and I told him to wait so for six Muhammad. months until I start managing the case. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, but, okay. I, I see my, my colleague was a pediatrician. He had the case who referred it to me and we together agreed, both together agreed that we will start surgical management in six months. It was a palpable case. When we waited for six months, uh, before, actually at three or four months age, the patient had a torsion of the testis and he lost his testis. Uh, well, Very unfortunate. Uh, yeah. Uh, my, my answer to this, if you operate at three months, uh, you will save uh, your case, but you will lose a lot of other cases from atrophy operating on such an early age. This okay. is my answer. Ahmed محمد سعد عايز يتكلم انا مش عارف اعمل له اميوت. السلام عليكم. السلام عليكم محمد دكتور سامح. اهلا وسهلا. تفضل يا محمد. ايوه محمد. محمد سعد اتفضل. لو عايز يكتب على الشات لو مش قادر يوصل المايك ما فيش مشكله. محمد سعد. الو ايوه سامح اهلا باشا اتفضل يا حبيبي حضرتك اهلا يا سامح هو في عندي بس كومنت انا قابلت حالتين حصل فيهم جنجرين في سنجل تيستس والاثنين بقوا انوركيا فانا مع حضرتك ان احنا نثبت الناحيه الثانيه 
بيرفكت يعني انا في رايي سنجل كيس از انف يعني طالما عرفنا انها ممكن تحصل ات از فيري الارمينج فاي ثينك وي نيد تو تو فيكس ات تمام بعد اذن حضرتك سؤالي لحضرتك كنت انا اتناقشت مع حضرتك قبل كده هاو تو افويد تيستيكولر تيل ان كيس اوف تراكشن بعد اذن حضرتك اد اد تو اس ذا تريكس جميل هو لو لاحظتوا الفيديو اللي انا عرضته كان فيه تيستيكولر تيل يعني one of the findings ساعات بنلاقي ان في peritoneal fold طويله قوي من التستس للابدومينال وول و we don't know exactly what the reason but I think uh, there are two reasons either the bite in the abdominal wall is thin or the bite in the testis is thin so you need to have a broad bite in the testis and a broad bite in the abdominal wall to avoid you uh, having this complex uh, Dr. Samak, can you comment on the chat uh, there was a comment on the chat about fixing or, or not fixing the contralateral tests. And she said it's unfair to take the decision on surgeon's preference. You have to explain very well to the family and uh, ask them for their uh, opinion. Of course. And when you explain to the parents that there is a possibility of testicular loss, although rare, they always agree on fixation. Uh, in the chat, I am from a service in Brazil, and we do a lot of shahatas technique. My doubt is on the risk of internal hernia and volvulus. Well, this is a very good question, and I can say that uh, this is the number 279 I received this question. Uh, all surgeons should be worried of a band inside the abdominal cavity, which might lead to internal strangulation. I would like to assure you that during 15 years of practice and a large number of cases all around the world, not me and any of our friends have seen a single case of internal hernia. And more than that, during surgery, I tried once to explain to my friends that the, uh, it's easy for the bowel to go behind, in and out. When I tried to grasp the bowel and put it behind the, the spermatic vessels, I couldn't. It is impossible. It is always behind. So be assured, it has never happened. It will never happen. Go and do more shihata technique. Uh, في Dr. Hussam Al Shafi, uh, raising hand. Uh, Hussam can uh, visit Kendria, and then go to Saudi Arabia. Sick kids of uh, Toronto. Father uh, Excellent presentation, Allah, Dr. Samah, as usual, as we always get okay. from you. Uh, the video is very excellent. I noticed yani, my comment on the, you, when you do the traction technique, you do it uh, from the scrotum directly, no inguinal incision, or you do inguinal incision? Uh, in small children, thin abdominal wall, I use a scrotal incision and pass the clamp from below. I don't put a trocar, some friends will put a trocar. I just put a curved long uh, clamp from the scrotum through the abdominal wall. The abdominal wall at this area is very thin. You don't need to force. In older children and in obese, I prefer to make a small inguinal incision, open the inguinal canal, and go through to avoid forcing my way through a thick abdominal wall. Uh, always you keep 12 weeks between the stages. You said if you have uh, bilateral, you do three stages. So always the gap is 12 weeks. 12 weeks, yes, exactly. Or longer, or you don't prefer uh, Not longer. Actually, uh, I have tried everything because at the beginning, I didn't have a number to, to stick to. So I tried two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, and 12 weeks. And uh, my friend, uh, uh, Darius from Poland uh, says to me he does it only for two weeks and he's having very good results. So I don't have a fixed number, but if you ask me about my practice, I wait for 12 weeks. Shukran, Dr. Samah. Shukran, Thank you very much. From the chat here, Dr. Samah, yeah. do you think that in Shahata operation, we should make more tension over the operated tests to make sure that the tension is enough for lengthening uh, of the cord after release of the pneumoperitoneum? Well, uh, testing after release of the pneumoperitoneum, of course, is a good way to, to judge the, the, the distance. And in the majority, which is 90% of the cases, you find uh, a limited amount of tension that is tested between zero and three centimeters from the deep ring, which is 90% of the cases, 
you can reach uh, to one centimeter from the abdominal wall on the other side. And during tying the stitch, you push the abdominal wall inside to touch the testis, not push, uh, pull on the testis. So there is minimal tension. For testis above three centimeters, I think the tension will be too much, might lead to slipping or to atrophy. Probably you need to do something else. This is only in 10% of the case. His question is, um, uh, technically, you need to make um, uh, uh, excess tension while the abdomen is insufflated so that after desufflation, the tension is reasonable. Uh, yes, exactly, because you expect that after uh, desufflation, the, the tension will come down. A question from Mustafa al -Ayuti. Is traction technique applicable for uh, children older than 10 years? Uh, my results shows that the older, the, uh, the less success. The best success in the, I do it at 12 months, uh, nine months to 12 months, this is the best success. When you do it at six years, it is less when you do it at 12 years, but still it is doable. And Muhammad Abdul Azim has published his series and he's having good results in uh, older age. So still, if it can go without undue tension, then you can do it. Can I add, please? I made uh, two adult patients. One is 31, and I completed the two stage successfully, and one is 16. It was uh, adolescent, and it went fine uh, for the two stages. Very nice. I, I didn't do that uh, age range, but uh, well, congratulations. This is very good. Yeah, I, I met one case for high inguinal testicle. Okay. It's not intra-abdominal, I inguinal testicle, and I, uh, I uh, bought a, a stay suture, and I start to do shahada technique, or to, uh, the, the, and by, by, by passing the suture to the scrotum, the bottom of the scrotum, directly through the inguinal canal. But unfortunately, the technique is failed due to maybe excessive tension on the suture line and cut through of the stitches. Uh, and now we are preparing to do the second stage. Yes, this shows uh, that, are, you, uh, yeah. are you advice, Yanni? Uh, I noticed in your video that the testicle was so near to the inguinal ring. Are you uh, maybe preferring to do the uh, traction suture through the inguinal canal toward the scrotum or, or to the contralateral side? Well, it's very appealing to put it to the scrotum and do it at one stage instead of two stages. But I'll tell you a big advantage of uh, shahata technique. You are, doing, you are doing the operation in a big cyelastic uh, sheet or a compartment, which is the abdominal cavity and the peritoneum, which is completely free of adhesions. If you try to do the, the traction inside the subcutaneous tissue, going the, all the way down to the uh, scrotum, you have a lot of adhesions, you have a lot of uh, fibrosis, and this will uh, cause failure. So we are lucky that doing the whole technique inside the abdominal cavity as if you are putting in a big cyelastic shape. No, I agree. I agree with you. Yeah. Uh, uh, the problem with Shahada technique, uh, to me at least, Yanni, uh, because I did the, the first cases, the testicle was very far. Yani, it, it's no. fixed to the posterior abdominal wall and not, the, not near to the inguinal ring. Uh, so traction, with, yani, in my cases, two to three cases, failed traction technique due to cut through because the testicle is very far away from the internal ring. I, uh, your video is demonstrating today that we, do, we will uh, start to do shahada technique again, but in the, if the testicle is near to the internal ring, not away, not, not fixed to the posterior abdominal wall. Uh, in that case, uh, we prefer now to do a Stephen Fowler technique uh, in two stages. Yes, uh, this is a very important point. 90% of the cases are within three centimeters, and this is good for shahata technique. The higher, uh, Fabio Sciarenzia from Italy is doing something I didn't do. He will do a multi-stage, not a two-stage uh, shahata. He will put it <clears throat> on the same side near the deep ring, then pass it to the other side, then pass it. So maybe do a three-stage or something. I didn't do, but he says he have good results with that. So he is, he is more stronger proponent of the technique more than I do. Uh, actually, I would like to uh, uh, to confirm on this uh, notion from Dr. Samah that 
doing uh, one, two, or maybe even three stages inside the abdomen is better than putting the testicles in the subcutaneous tissue and coming back. It's a hill and carries uh, a big instance of injuring the uh, uh, vessels and the uh, vas, vas differens. Um, uh, we have a question saying, if uh, what do you think about a, a, a palpable undescended testicle with a hernia in a one month infant? Uh, I think the straightforward. To say. I go for it. I go for it, of course, you need, if yes, there is a hernia, but be very careful on the testicular vasculature and the In, in the last edition, Abbas Al-Hassani, in the last edition of Ashcraft Pediatric Surgery Textbook, they mentioned the treatment of intra-abdominal testicle is either laparoscopy, uh, or laparotomy. My question is, is still anyone doing laparotomy? Uh, I have not read this uh, actually. Uh, um, what do you think? I think it should be obsolete because yes. if you don't have a laparoscope and you have to go by open, it's a hell of a job. Laparoscopy is 100 times uh, easier and faster. Don't do it. If you operate on a herniotomy of an undescended test, at the age of one month. Dr. Tamer? Dr. Tamer, I didn't hear how that. Ah, Maratania Tamer? On an inguinal hernia with or cubic C at, uh, with undescended at the age of one month. Okay. Uh, technique or different skills. Um, yeah, and it was interrupted in many parts. Uh, if I uh, if I hear right, uh, so I like uh, operating on understanding this is at one month with inguinal hernia. Is there any different approach? Uh, well, nothing different, but uh, I have just operated one such case uh, recently. He had an uh, understand testis at the beginning. I told him, come back later. Then after two weeks later, he came with a hernia. Then we said, we need to operate on both of them. And I did it with, with all the precaution to take care of the vas and vessel. It went perfectly right. And the testis is, is so far is uh, in good size and good position. You need to follow this up, of course, clinically until the age of one year at least. The, there is a, a question in the chat. I, I think they need more elaboration about the, the issue of ligating or not the processus vaginalis. I think what you meant, Dr. Samah, is that you have to separate the processus vaginalis and cut it, but to ligate or not, this is the issue. But you have to separate to elongate oh. the, the cord. Is this? Oh, exactly. Exactly, Dr. Akram. Uh, separation will give you length, uh, maybe one centimeter of length. It's very important. You separate. But to insist on ligating is not important because sometimes it's so fragile. Try to hold it, it tears down. And if you insist, you injure the vas and vessel. So separate. If it is uh, easily uh, manageable, you can control it, then take a stitch. If it is not easy, just forget it. Okay. Uh, Dr. Rafi Chalabi. Uh, Dr. Dr. Samah, uh, I have uh, just comment on the uh, questions of Dr. Bagdilula about uh, tracting the testis for and the same side of the scrotum. Uh, because uh, one of the mechanisms you mentioned before uh, of fixing the testis through the contralateral side is making the testicular vessels and the vas vulnerable to the uh, movement of the intestine and the respiratory movement of the respiratory of the abdominal muscle during respiration. What do you think? Uh, exactly, Professor Rafi. Uh, we didn't know all these facts when we uh, first suggested the technique. I think we were lucky because uh, being in a big uh, peritoneal sac, free of adhesion, having the bowel uh, very gradually stretching. If you remember the old days when you used to do fix the testes to the pubic tubercle and then come back, it's a hell of a job to dissect from the adhesions and you injure everything. 
So uh, you are right, Professor Rafik, the, the mechanism of lengthening actually is in the weight of the bowel uh, against the spermatic vessel. This you don't find in fixing it in the uh, inguinal region or to the pubic tubercle. So please don't do, do that. It's, it's a hell of a job. Number two, uh, why you are still using facial closer for retrieving the suture from inside? Although you have a Mediflex, which is uh, more thinner and more easier to use. And you have two. <laughs> <laughs> you know all the secrets, uh, Professor Rafi. Uh, this was an old video. I'm using uh, your uh, uh, Mediflex needed thinner and much easier to use. Or a simple, uh, simple needle, white bore needle with a loop as you do in, in uh, hernia, uh, laparoscopic hernia and you can pick the, the needle outside. There are a lot of techniques, and you are right. Dr. Samah, a question from Saleh Shtewi. Mm. Uh, uh, what about retractile testis with uh, hemiscrotal hypoplasia? Here you have to suspect uh, highly that this is a low uh, undescended testis. Because the retractile testis normally does not have uh, scrotal hypoplasia. Uh, on the contrary, the diagnosis is having a normal looking scrotum. So if you have a hypoplasia, you follow up very carefully and make sure it is not a low lying uh, undescended test. Exactly. There are many questions asking you to elaborate more on the management of adolescent and adult uh, undescended testis and why we do orchidectomy and why not? Uh, nice. Uh, leaving, uh, let's talk about unilateral and bilateral. The unilateral uh, undescended testis, he has a, a normal contralateral. The fertility is normal to start with. And this testis is not functioning at all uh, for spermatogenesis. And leaving it outside the scrotum until puberty makes the cancer risk is high. So the, all the guidelines recommend that if he is below 32 years, you do a correction because the life expectancy and possibility of developing cancer. If he is above 32 years, then the risk of developing malignancy is less, and you compare it with the risk of general anesthesia, so you observe by follow-up clinical examination, self-examination, and ultrasound. In the uh, bilateral... We have, a... yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have an, uh, an in interesting question about abdominal testes with abdominal wall defects repaired before at birth. How do you approach that, laparoscopically or open? Uh, abdominal wall defects, uh, if, it, if, if it leads to extensive uh, abdominal, uh, intra-abdominal adhesions, then laparoscopy might be difficult. But I always start with laparoscopy because, as I said, it's much easier to do the operation by laparoscopy than by open surgery and m more successful. And there is another question about the post-traction adhesions. Have you seen abdominal adhesions after the traction surgery? Uh, if you mean uh, adhesions from uh, the uh, traction with itself. Or bladder, yes, with the yeah. first stage. Well, uh, almost none. Uh, in one video, I'll show you a piece of omentum coming to the site of the stitch. But it's notably, because again, it's like a big silastic sheet, you find m very minimal adhesions. Uh, cutting of the connecting band, it took five seconds. So this is notably one of the benefits or great advantage of the technique is absence of adhesion. Exactly. And do you think it, it has something to do with manipulating the peritoneum over the testis itself, like with undue uh, handling or abrasions of the peritoneum can do more adhesions? Of course, if you denude the peritoneum, you are liable to more adhesion. And this we have seen in when we used to do a bilateral simultaneous. Some of the cases are very nicely sliding vas and vessels over each other, and some other you find adhesion. And I believe that this adhesion happened because, as you said, there is a loss of peritoneum covering the vas or vessel. But we stopped doing bilateral simultaneous. Again, for the unilateral to minimize adhesion. You keep the section to a minimum. You need only to divide the gubernaculum. You need to divide the lateral peritoneum lateral to the sticker vessel, and that's it. Nothing more. And you'll find 
almost uh, negligible adir. Thank you for the uh, uh, careful remarks. Um, would you mind if we have more of the audience uh, to um, engage? We have Dr. Abu Bakr raising his hand for a long time now. Of course, so, welcome. Yeah, please. Okay. Hello, hi. Uh, so my, I have two questions. My first one is, you have two scenarios. Uh, a child who is nine, nine months old, uh, you put the, for a non-palpable uh, understanding testicle, you put the scope in and you find a vanishing testis. Uh, my question, do you fix the other side or not? And uh, the other scenario is like uh, a seven years old boy, non-palpable testis, you put the scope in and it's a vanishing test. Do you do the uh, contralateral fixation? Mm -hmm. uh, what I mean, does it uh, is the age uh, differ in the management of the contralateral side, whether to fix it or not? This is my first question. The other question is, uh, a non-palpable testis, you put the scope in and you cannot find the testicle, you cannot find a vase, you cannot find uh, a vessel. Uh, what should What should we do next? And thank you. Uh, thank you very much. That's actually two important questions. Uh, the first question, I always do uh, PEXI uh, regardless of the age, in nine months and at seven years, because the possibility is there and torsion can happen at any age. And if it happens, it is catastrophic. The patient will be anorthic. But the second one is uh, very important actually, because you never go out to the scope unless you see the end point is blind ending vessels, not vas. You need to see blind ending. If you don't see it, you don't go out. You look in atypical places. What are the atypical places that the testis might be hiding in? One is retrovesical, two is subrenal. Because there is always uh, testicular vessels. Uh, you'll never have a case without testicular vessels. You need to see it, where it is going, blind ending or going to. Sometimes you don't find the vaso vessels, you tilt the patient Trendelenburg and you search retroperitoneal up to the kidney. Many times you'll see the vas going up and the vessels very short and reaching to a subrenal test. So you need to reach the blind ending vessel to end your search. And would you so do the key is follow the vessel? Yes. And and would you do a traction technique then for the subrenal uh, uh, testicle? Well, the subrenal is uh, not typical for traction because it's very far away. You cannot bring it to the other side. So maybe here uh, you have one of two options, either to do a classical uh, fowler stephen but take my advice, uh, uh, addition to fowler stephen in this case, take a stitch and bring the testis down to the same side in order to find it easily next time. If it is behind the, below the kidney, and you try to find it next time with adhesion will be difficult. So you divide, you ligate, you divide, and you fix it exactly like in traction, but to the same side, near to the deep ring on the same side. When you come next time, you find it easy. Or yeah, you... Another, um, another question from Dr. Yeah. Ahmed Saad. Yeah. Dr. Ahmed, are you there? Dr. Ahmed Saad, Ismail. Okay, looks like he's been waiting for a long time. So, uh, we have Dr. Abdelmanam Shams. Good evening, uh, all. Dr. Samah, Dr. Tamir, and all. Uh, thank you for this uh, good uh, presentation, Dr. Samah, and your technique. Uh, what about your uh, uh, experience with cases of non palpable unilateral understand testes? Are you doing foul, uh, snood grass technique uh, first before uh, laparoscopic uh, assessment? Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, actually, Warren Snodgrass published uh, his paper about initial scrotal incision before doing laparoscopy, and he says that finding a testicular nubbin in some percent of cases will save unnecessary lap laparoscopy. Well, uh, I have read the paper, it's a nice paper, but uh, I don't do it, I do laparoscopy, because 
sometimes uh, it is very small or absent. You cannot be very sure actually that it is there, but it is good to consider, of course. Thank you, Dr. Samah. Uh, we have Dr. Uh, Yahya Saeed Al Ahl. Dr. Yahya, are you there? Dr. Yahya? اللي بيتكلم بس unmute الفيديو بتاعه يا جماعه عشان ايه هو انا I'm mute but it looks like they are waiting for a long time so uh, دكتور محمد ابو هيبه again دكتور محمد you have a question uh, uh, yes not really a question but uh, rather a comment um, I have modified my uh, traction technique to uh, do a sling instead of a stitch that passes through the tunica. Uh, using a sling that goes in between the vas and the vessels, uh, actually uh, uh, um, uh, creates less of adhesions. We, I, never, I never find a testis adherent to the anterior abdominal wall by using a sling. Uh, however, I'm not sure if this is a safe uh, traction uh, technique, considering the well-being of the uh, epididymis. Do you have any uh, comments, Dr. Samah? Uh, thank you, Mohammed. Actually, Mohammed has uh, got a large number of uh, cases. He's in very much interested in technique, and he has got many publications related to that. And I like is always trying to improvise or to uh, innovate something to fine tune the technique. It sounds good, but uh, I have a dictum. If, if you are playing a winning game, you never ch change your strategy. I'm doing well with this technique, so I am not planning to uh, change. And as you said, the caput uh, epididymis is exactly in this area. And probably putting a stitch in this area can compress, lead to stricture or fibrosis of this area. So it's, it's appealing. Maybe if you keep thinking, you can come up with something uh, less invasive. People are worried about the stitch going, but we are going to the tunica, uh, albuginia, and uh, it's not causing any harm. So. Dr. Ahmed Abdel Mohsen. Dr. Ahmed Abdel Mohsen. Okay, thank you, Dr. Tamer. Uh, I need uh, to thank Professor. Ali, switch to Dr. Ahmed, please. Raise your raise the volume, please. Okay. Fadala. Can you hear me well now? Ah, Fadala. Okay. Uh, first of all, I need to thank you, Professor Sana, for this uh, magnificent lecture. Uh, as always, uh, I enjoyed uh, your speech today, uh, and I need to ask you. Uh, a question about uh, a very important topic that's related to the undescended testis. Uh, I've always uh, read about the incidence of uh, cancer formation in uh, the undescended testis, but unfortunately none of the books or the papers uh, has been distinguished between uh, the intra-abdominal or the palpable undescended testis with regards to this uh, impiety. And so I always ask myself, is there a difference between both anxieties? Is there still the same risk of getting uh, a malignant tumor in the palpable undescended testis uh, at the same percentage like the uh, impalpable undescended testis or the palpable uh, is usually not get uh, such a tumor? So I think uh, uh, I, I have searched uh, a lot to find any uh, evidence to differentiate between both entities, but uh, unfortunately, uh, I haven't found any. So uh, I need to ask you about your experience uh, in relation to this topic. Thank you very much, uh, Ahmed. Actually, it's a very uh, nice question because uh, there is, I'll send you the reference, uh, there is a real difference between the location of the testis and the instance of malignancy. First, the ectopic testis and the ascending testis, there is no cancer risk, ectopic and ascending. 
And as you go higher, the cancer risk is higher, which means the palpable understanding is less, the uh, inguinal is higher, uh, the intra-abdominal is higher, the bilateral is higher, cases associated with hypospadias or genital ambiguity is higher, syndromic uh, cases is much higher cancer risk, except for the intra-abdominal bilateral intra-abdominal testes associated with complete androgen insensitivity because of lack of androgen response, they are not high. These are the only ones among the intra-abdominal tests. But abdominal, to, in a simple word, abdominal and bilateral much higher than inguinal and uh, uh, ectopic. Dr. Sam, we have an interesting question about spinogonadal fusion. What do you do if you face one? Uh, Splenogonadal fusion, uh, there are many subtypes. Of course, it is rare. And you need to preserve the integrity of both uh, because each one have got a function. In, in uh, children below the age of five years, you have the uh, absence of splenic tissue will lead to overwhelming post-splenectomy sepsis. So you need to preserve splenic tissue. And of course, you need to preserve the integrity of the uh, testes depending on the pattern of blood supply. Uh, another question about uh, cross testicular ectopia, uh, how to manage? Uh, again, there are different uh, varieties and the management depends on uh, the anatomical location and the uh, uh, blood supply coming from which direction. Mm. So there is a recurring question about is there a, a place for surgical intervention for the tractile testes? Actually, a couple of times you're asking about criteria when to operate. Is there a, a surgical rule in retractile testes? When they approve, they are not true retractile tests. Exactly. <laughs> but let's, let's make agreement. Retractile testes, provided you are sure retractile, you never operate. But some are borderline. Some, one might uh, diagnose as retractile testes, I will uh, diagnose as low-lying abdominal uh, uh, scrotal testes. So uh, never operate on a classical retractile testes, but uh, if it is not retractile or low-lying uh, scrotal testes, I have seen it uh, after my diagnosis. I diagnosed the retractile, and I see the patient after one year, I found it low scrotal test, uh, high scrotal test, and then I operated. So follow your cases. When you are, you cannot bring the test comfortably, as Dr. Magdilola said, without pain. You cannot bring it to the bottom of the scrotum and stay there for some time, uh, never operate. Dr. Yes, Magdilola, we are, we are working, yes, we are working now to answer your question, Dr. Damer. We are working, uh, me and Ahmed Nabil uh, Fauzi, and the, uh, our lecturer and Dr. Tabir Fakhri on the three points. Uh, tenderness on bowling down the testicle, the length of the bowling down, and the degree of stamen inside the scrotum. The, the, the pain, painful action or painful bowling, length of bowling, we the statement of that uh, testicle inside the scrotum. I found that in all uh, retractile testicle, you can bowl enough length, painless, and the testicle stays for some while inside the scrotum. Otherwise, in high scrotal testicle, octopic testicle, usually it's found in the, uh, uh, in the, in the uh, superficial inguinal pouch. The testicle, the, the bowling down was painful and short, and the testicle cannot stay even, yeah, it, it just ascend again after you release your finger. And I, I think I uh, presented a paper in, uh, in the, in, uh, uh, as, uh, Short talk, Yanni, in uh, our meeting before, maybe, I, th I think, in Lotso. Uh, my question to Dr. Sam, or my comment, Yanni, about the, the starting time of, the, of doing orthopexy, uh, you are, I think you are insisting to delay to 12 months. Uh, lot, we are, as an uh, uh, pediatric uh, surgeons, who are get used to do a herniotomy even in a little boys, little neonates, Yanni, even in uh, 12 days, uh, 20 days, one month, two months. So I think that this, uh, yani the, the, the section 
of the spermatic cord is not a great job for us. And we all, I think, uh, regarding ourselves as a good pediatric surgeons, we can start doing it at the age of six months safely. Well, I, I agree, of course, uh, Dr. Magdi, on your first part, important to distinguish the retractile testers from low-lying uh, undescent testers. But the other part, if the recommendation or the guidelines say six to 12, means six is correct and 12 is correct. But I am a little bit uh, cautious I, with my, of course, I know all of you are experts and can do it. For a hernia, the testicular vessels in a normal testis is different from the understand the testis. And sometimes I find the vessels so flimsy and they are not comfortable to me at the operation. So I, I take the advantage of taking care of the more advantage or safety to the patient and still during the uh, the, uh, the window, the accepted window of the guideline. And I tell you, of course, this is something uh, you, you may be afraid that if you delay the patient, you'll do, go and uh, do the operation in, in another place because the patient is worried. But I tell you, my patients will always wait for me. Dr. Omar Ajaz. Dr. Omar Ajaz, he, he lowered his hand. He's asking about uh, what about uh, when, when to take uh, uh, biopsy in undescent tests? Well, this reminds me of the work of uh, uh, our friend from Bosnia, Farouk Slimovic, who recommends to take a biopsy always from all cases of undescent tests to detect a very important finding, which is the delay of mini puberty, the maturation of germ cells. Because even if you do a successful uh, orchiopexy, some of the patients will have uh, bad quality of sperm production. So he routinely, for all cases of undescent testes, will take a biopsy and depending on that, will give post-operatively hormonal treatment or not. That's uh, Busserlin intranasal spray. This is his practice because, to answer your question, for me, I don't do it except for the uh, older uh, patient, the adolescent above the 12 years, I, you might make uh, a small biopsy intraoperatively to detect carcinoma inside for the older patient. Okay. And of course, it is a very good idea if you are doing a research between comparison between fowler Stephen and Shahata technique. Maybe for the future, I'm giving you an idea for research. If you take a biopsy and prove that after stage one traction, stage one fowler Stephen, you see the spermatogonia, how much affected in stage one fowler Stephen and stage one traction. And if you can prove that there is better histology for Shahata technique, then this will be very good because you are not cutting the blood supply. There is a, um, an interesting question here about uh, if you see an abdominal testis during the repair of uh, gastroschisis or diaphragmatic hernia, is there anything to do at that time of surgery? at birth? Uh, the patient is at birth and you have an intra-abdominal test, as you mean? Yes. Well, I think it's, it's good to do uh, traction if possible at this stage because uh, you are there and uh, the laxity of the vessel and the, the distance is short. And probably there's good reason to start traction at this age and come back later after three months. And uh, there are another question about triple testis, if you find a third testicle. I don't know, uh, from Dr. Ali Ijab. Yes. Then you are a very lucky surgeon. <laughs> we have plenty of them now. Not <laughs> A lucky patient. <laughs> lucky surgeon, because sometimes you go for an impalpable testis and you go out and you find nothing. So if you go and you have an extra one, then you are lucky. It's it's very rare uh, possibility, but it is uh, there. You need to warn the patient about the presence and uh, nothing else. Uh, okay. Dr. Samah, should we consider any child with bilateral non-palpable testes? In, in these cases, we have to consider DSD. And in these cases, uh, it's opposite to what have what we have said. 
using radiologic investigations is warranted and is maybe the first step in the evaluation. Do you agree? Of course, of course. Uh, number one, if you have a bilateral impalpable, you go for karyotyping, you go for imaging, and you, ch you, you make sure uh, of the uh, possible uh, ambiguity of uh, intercept. Dr. Magdi Lola. Thank you, Dr. Sam. Uh, uh, today, the, the, <clears throat> this lecture is uh, highly successful in changing my mind, my mind about shadow technique. I promise <laughs> I will start it again in a new principle. And then in the, in the uh, <clears throat> because my experience before was uh, not fruitful because the testicle was too much higher. I started say, I had a technique and run cases. I, I will start again. Thank you very much for your interesting presentation, as usual, Yanni, for you. <laughs> Thank you. And I, uh, <clears throat> I will leave that now. Excuse me. Okay. Thank you so yeah. much. I'm waiting for your results with Shahata Technique. So we have like two questions about a small size testicle after doing a two-stage uh, orcupexy. Is there anything to do uh, like hormonal treatment for small size testes after orcupexy? Uh, number one, of course, you, you try all the measures to minimize this, uh, but it happens. And sometimes it happens before you touch the patient. The testis is smaller than normal. Uh, then there is role if you do surgery and you have a smaller than normal, there is role for hormonal treatment that will increase the vascularity and size of the testes, but unfortunately, this effect is temporary. It does not last long. Exactly. And there, we have like few requests for more data about doing a biopsy. How to do it? A testicular biopsy. Well, actually, uh, uh, and this is from uh, uh, someone who does it routinely for all cases. I do it very infrequently, but I tell you the, the, uh, the technique of uh, Farouk Slimovic. Actually, people think that the sticker biopsy is taking a wedge of a small test that would make it smaller. And actually, it is not at all like this. You, you bring a scalpel uh, number 11, and you squeeze the testis with a little bit of pressure, and you just incise the tonica albigini. And with a, a little bit of pressure and squeezing on the testis, you will get some very small amount of uh, soft uh, tissue coming out of the tonic albigini. It's microscopic. You take it on the uh, tip of the scalpel and you put it in uh, glutaral dehyde. Glutaral dehyde. This is his technique. And you put it in a dark uh, glass because it's affected with light and you send it for microscopy. He's doing it for all cases. It's not at all uh, a big amount of testicular tissue as you might expect. You take a wedge and you take a stitch. You take a snip with 11 blade and you squeeze the testis, you, you will find a few cells coming out. You take it on the tip of the knife. Okay. I'm sorry, I, I, I'm with Dr. Hassan al Haladi. I'm sorry. Okay. Dr. Hassan, do you have a comment? Hi, Salam Alaikum. Hi, Salam Alaikum. Salam Alaikum. Akram, thank you very much for joining the, the meeting immediately after uh, finishing the presentation of uh, Prof. Sam, uh -huh. but I'm enjoying very much the, the discussion. Uh, the discussion is very lovely and uh, very, very, very well, moder well moderated by uh, Akram and the Tamir. Thank you all. And the response of uh, Sam, Professor Sam Shahata is excellent. Uh, I, I have to just comment the, because there was a question about um, what to do with the cross octobia and the answer uh, was uh, uh, from professor uh, shahata was according to the case but uh, in the vast majority of this case i have a couple of them actually uh, in all of them uh, the case i have seen uh, i would uh, very much advise not to try to separate especially if you go by laparoscopy uh, and uh, uh, not to try to separate both of them. In one case, we have tried, the first case we have tried by laparoscopy to separate uh, the
one which was not descended from the one side, the right side was already in the scrotum. The left side was uh, migrating ectopic to uh, and attached at the right internal ring. So we tried to separate by laparoscopy both of them, and it will end some injury. But likely, what we feel uh, that there was disconnection of the vase and epidermis from the testis. That, but I would suggest not to try to do that and to bring both of them through the same site and not to try to redo and re anatomy again to take the right side and the, the, the already descended to keep it and to try to leave the left side uh, to the left to, to try to bring it through the left internal ring. Just, just to bring both of them through the, the nearest, uh, through the nearest internal ring and not try to separate both of them. This is what. The second comment regarding to the splenogonadal. We started, I don't know why it started to see more cases, five, you see three cases. Uh, I would suggest also uh, uh, to be more to the side of the spleen. You can, because if you tried during uh, by laparoscopy, this was actually by laparoscopy. If you try to go more towards the, 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 the testis, by the heat during the separation, we're gonna lose the testis. So uh, try to be more and more toward the spleen. And, uh, uh, and then uh, after separating, reassess if they are uh, vulnerable to bring the testis at one stage or not to stage. If you do, if you can be bring to so one stage, it's okay. If not, just to treat it as ordinary uh, two stage procedure with attraction or uh, ligation of and uh, foul stevens. Uh, this is my two comments on both on both cases. The I, I almost agree with almost what I have seen during the discussion, uh, and uh, and actually uh, enjoy very much the the. the uh, the, the, the response of from uh, Sam and from uh, uh, the moderation, excellent moderation from both of you, Akram and Tim. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Hassan. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. Hello? So we have Dr. Mohammed Shaheen. Assalamu okay. alaikum. Uh, thank you for Tim, Dr. Akram, Dr. Sam, for good presentation. Uh, I'd like to I'd like to ask about uh, uh, what about the redo technique for a case of uh, interabdominal test extracted brief by shahata technique okay dr muhammad uh, thank you very much very good question in some cases i didn't mention that uh, some cases there is slipping of the traction stitch this was uh, more in the earlier series now we don't find this maybe because we refine the technique more but it happened and it is uh, liable to happen when one is starting the technique, slipping of the testes from the traction stage. And then you can do a redo shihata technique on the same principle, because uh, it's very easy. You can do it. Probably some lengthening ha has happened, and the second redo will be easier, and the results are as good as the uh, uh, first stage uh, traction. Uh, in, in mixed gonadal, this genesis, what is the proper site of biopsy? I think this is not relevant, but if you wish to comment, Dr. Professor Sama. Uh, if you have, a, for example, if you have an ovo testis, then you, you need to have a biopsy from the suspected ovarian and suspected testicular poles. But if you have a mixed uh, gonadal dysgenesis or streak gonads, you can here follow the uh, the blood supply and avoid biopsy site that might jeopardize the vascularity or the vascular pole of the testes. What about post-operative follow-up? You depend on uh, ultrasound uh, evaluation or uh, ro the rosary uh, orchidometer, or you compare with the normal uh, tests? Uh, first, I need to follow the patient at least two years post-operatively. So I see him at one month, at three months, six months, and then uh, every six months until two years, I check with uh, color Doppler ultrasound for vascularity. And actually there are vascularity indices that's called the resistive index and the mean blood flow. 
to ma make sure that there's only not only a, a, a test test with poor blood supply, but you need to measure in numbers the blood flow to the test test, and you measure the volume compared to the other side. Um, I think, um, are there any more questions? Well, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Samah. Yeah, hi, Asela. At this point, we would like to uh, thank uh, Professor Samah for this elegant, evidence-based lecture uh, and for his responses. And we, we really enjoyed this meeting. Uh, we would like to thank all the participants for their uh, endurance and uh, um, we would like to uh, soon meet in a very fruitful uh, lecture like this. Thanks, Dr. Samah. Thanks, Dr. Tamer, uh, Mohammed Saada, uh, Mohammed Abmalak, and all the participants. I would like to thank the wonderful group of organization. Actually, they made a professional uh, top level uh, meeting. I personally enjoyed all the questions, uh, comments, and discussion. And uh, we have been for two, year, two hours now. We didn't feel the passage of time. Thank you all for sharing and wait for our next m meeting with some other topic. Thank you very much and stay safe. Thank you very much. And uh, we thank you all for your patience. Thank you for the great presentation and nice uh, discussion. And we hope like uh, we get rid of the virus soon. Thank you. Dr. Tamer? Dr. Tamer? Mohammed. السلام عليكم بنصحى حاجه جدا في سامح بعد اذنك انا هعمل اناونسمنت على اللقاء القادم ان شاء الله معانا الاستاذ الدكتور عصام الحلبي يوم الاربع الساعه 9 هيكلمنا على الهيرش سبرانج ديزيز جميل جدا صباحا ومساء 9 مساء دكتور عصام الحلبي هيكلمنا على البيت فولز ان مانجمنت ان هيرش سبرانج ديزيز ان شاء الله انت كده ساعدة ساعد انت كده مش محتاج 500 انت عايز تحتاج 1000 بقى يبقى عند ربنا يبارك فيك. نقطة تانية أحب أنوع عنها إن إن شاء الله البيدياتريك يورجي كلاب الدكتور سامح شحاتة معانا فيه هم بيجهزوا بروجرام هنحاول ننسق بين البروجرام بتاعنا وبتاعهم هم عندهم الأسبوع الجاي محاضرة إن شاء الله على البيزايكوتريك ريفلكس أند ري إمبلانتيشن هيقدمها الدكتور وليد داوود أستاذ مساعد المسالك بجامعة اسكندرية. <تصفيق> بس لسه ما تحددش الميعاد هو كان الميعاد للاسف هيبقى الاربع فاحنا ان شاء الله بنستاذنهم يخلوهم ميعاد تاني واحتمال كبير يبقى الخميس الساعه 9 مساء فان شاء الله هننسق يكون في تنسيق بيننا وبينهم بحيث ان كلنا نستفيد من المحاضرات. جميل جدا ما, ما شاء الله الميتنجز واحد مش ملاحق عليها دلوقتي. ربنا يكرمك يا فندم اشكرك جدا واشكر كل اساتذتك. اتفضل دكتور تامر ودكتور اكرم كملوا المدرسه شكرا. شكرا جزيلا. شكرا يا دكتور محمد شكرا جزيلا. شكرا. شكرا جزيلا لكل الجس والدكتور سامح ويعني نشوفكم على خير دكتور بيكي طبعا منورنا <تصفيق> نشوفكم على خير جميعا مع السلامه